Ruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. Last week we um, began a discussion about laws. And uh, this week I'd like to uh, continue with that discussion. <clears throat> Hopefully bring some light to it. So, let us look at the 613 commandments. Again, we know that God <clears throat> gave the Jewish nation 613 commandments. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're broken up into 248 positive commandments and 365 negative commandments. Uh, these numbers are not random. The 248 positive commandments connect to the 248 limbs of the body and the 365 negative commandments connect to the 365 days of the year. Every one of our limbs, every one of the limbs of our body says to us, so to speak, please do the commandment that is connected with me. And every day of the year asks us that we not sin on their day. This connection is so tangible that on a very sublime spiritual level, uh, there are many times people that are able to feel a pain in their body and connected to a spiritual source in one of their 248 limbs. See, they see their illness as a physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency. They cure their body by repenting for the action that may have, they may have transgressed through the unsanctioned use of that limb of their body. Everything is connected. You know, they tell a story of a great rabbi who went to a specialist <clears throat> since he was feeling ill. The specialist examined the rabbi and prescribed medication. He didn't take the medication. So his students asked him why he wasn't taking the medication. After all, wasn't that why he went to the doctor in the first place? He said no. He told them that the only reason that he went to the specialist was he himself could not locate the sin that he had transgressed that had weakened his body. Once the specialist informed him what his ailment consisted of, ah, now he had all the information that he needed to spiritually correct his soul and then his physical body could heal naturally. So we see that our souls and our bodies are connected, both physically and spiritually. You know, people complain about all the laws and restrictions that Judaism places on a person. The question we have to ask is, who is freer? A secular individual who is free to do as he wishes, or a religious individual who has to follow all the commandments of the Torah? Logic would dictate that the secular individual would be freer. After all, he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Sounds good, <laughs> but that may not really be the case. If we look closely at people in general, we find that everyone is an addict. Everyone is addicted to something. There is something in that, in their, that rules their lives. It may not make sense to anyone else, but to them, it fits. So, that being the case, the question again, is the secular individual really free? Or are they being directed and influenced in all their decisions by their addiction? None of their, none of their decisions are really objective. It's all a rationalization. They acknowledge that they have a fault, but they feel, well, what's the big deal? After all, everyone has a fault. They just accept who they are. Why change? On the other hand, the religious individual also has his addictions. However, God has forced him to examine not only his deeds, but also his motivation. His decisions are not subjective. They are objective. What does God want from me? He sees himself as a soldier serving in God's army. A soldier gets his orders and he marches. He may not want to follow the order. He's tired. He's hungry. He may feel really he's not in the mood to fight a battle today. All of his feelings are immaterial. He was given a direct order, a direct command from his king, and the king's will is absolute. Disobedience comes with consequences. Think of the laws of the Torah as lanes in a highway. The road is replete with signs. Some are laws such as the speed limits. Others are informational laws of instructions such as entrances and exits, how many miles to your destination, gas stations, food and hotels. Then there are other signs that are warnings, upcoming curves, steep incline, falling rocks, construction zone. As we know, all highways have their lanes. 
well marked so that everyone knows exactly where they should be. Imagine if they just blacktopped a highway and they have not yet painted in the lanes. One big black road. Freedom. Huh. Without the lanes, now you can drive anywhere you want. No restrictions. And that may not be true. I mean, pardon me, it may be true that you can, but how safe would you be? Uh, imagine a sharp curve in the highway without the lane markings. How many cars would take the curve together? Answer, one. No one would trust the car next to them. In addition, all the cars would be cautious and probably drive just a little slower just to be on the safe side. The next day, they paint in the lanes for the highway. Guess what? Now there are three cars navigating the sharp curve, not one. Not only that, all the cars are doing the speed limit. Many of them, in fact, are even speeding. What changed? The lanes were installed. Now people can see where they are driving. They are being shown the proper path. Even if they drift out of their lane, they can quickly return since the lanes are clearly marked. You know, this can be compared to those who have Torah and those who do not. When you try to navigate life without Torah, without laws, life becomes more difficult. With every decision, you use different criteria. All of your decisions are subjective. On the other hand, if you follow the Torah, our instruction manual, the lanes are well marked and the highway is well lit. All of your decisions are based on one thing and one thing only. What does God expect of me? So who is really free? A secular or religious individual? The complaint about religion? Too many laws. Yet without laws, we as a society would cease to exist. In one form or another, many of the secular laws that we, fought, that we keep find their origins in the writings of the Bible. You know, the founders of the United States founded this country based on Judean Christian values. They actually studied the Torah in Hebrew. There was even a debate as to whether to make English or Hebrew the national language of the United States. In fact, on the crest of Yale University are written in Hebrew the words, Urim v'tumim, which mean light and truth. This is an allusion to the breastplate, which was also called the Urim v'tumim, that was worn by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest in the temple. When the nation would need to ask a question of God which needed immediate attention, such as, should they go to war? The letters that were etched into the 12 stones would light up. It was a form of GPS, godly communication, with the nation through the Kohen Gadol. So, God doesn't need laws. Whether we are good or bad doesn't add or diminish to his being. So what are all these rules for? For us. Many of the laws, not to kill, not to steal, morality, kindness, charity. It really, these are all commandments that, for the most part, we would all agree on. But then there is the commandment to rest on the Shabbat. Where we are sequestered for 25 hours with no computer, cell phone, TV, Xbox. Torture. Think of it. Wow. God actually wants us, no matter how busy our lives may be, to take time out and spend real time with our families. And on holidays, even more time. Can you imagine that? And by the way, God is also your father. He too would like to spend some quality time with you. He understands that during the week, many of us are too busy to stay alone properly. But then there is always the Shabbat and the Yom Tovim, a time to reconnect. He is always there, waiting. Yes, even in the morning, when we enter the synagogue, God our Father is already there waiting for us. As he put on our talit, he hugs us and embraces us with love and affection. We then put on our hand to fill in on our bicep, and we ask him to give us the strength to be able to succeed in all of our endeavors this day. Next, we put on our head filling on the crown of our heads. We acknowledge that our success any success that we experience is due to the gift of wisdom and understanding that he has bestowed upon us. After our morning conference, we are now ready to take on the world. 
we have finished our morning meditation. After the day is done, the sun is set and hopefully our day went well. God, like any loving parent, would like to hear about our day. The evening prayer, another chance to connect, to talk out our emotions, all of them, positive and negative. That's what prayer is for. Talk to God, our evening meditation. Then there's the prayer that many think is the most difficult of the three, since its time factor would make it difficult to remember and observe. Both the morning and evening prayers can be prayed at more or less the same time all year long. The afternoon prayer, the mincha, which in Hebrew, mincha means gift, is appropriately named so, since there are times when it may inconvenience one's plans for the day. There, of course, is another way to look at the afternoon prayer. It is always a good idea to step away from our thoughts, take a time out. It's amazing how that can at times create new ideas and maybe even better direction than we had before. So in the middle of our secular world, we make sure to include our spiritual world, asking God's assistance that all of our decisions should be correct. Meditation. So long before it became fashionable, our sages recognized the necessity for a Jew to meditate, to re reconnect to his creator daily, both to that part of God that is inside and outside of himself. Once he finds that, he will find his true being. We need to realize that this journey takes a lifetime. We need to constantly recharge our spiritual battery. We need to build up our spiritual muscle, so to speak, so that we don't run out of strength and determination. We need to see prayer as our spiritual connection to life. Consistency, routine, and rituals constitute the soil which allow the seeds of innovation and invention to grow. Yes, the Torah is a book of laws. The difference between Jewish law and secular law is that Jewish law is based on being preventative and secular law is based on being punitive. There's a story that I heard about Rabbi Dr. Avram Tursky, who had passed away recently. He was a noted psychiatrist who dealt primarily with all types of addiction. The story goes that before he could receive his board certification, which would may then make him a licensed psychiatrist, he was required to undergo a psychoanalysis. When he stood before the board, they asked him who had done his psychoanalysis, and he replied to Torah. He explained to them that he was an Orthodox Jew, and the Torah had already warned him of all of his addictions. He had already been warned about his narcissistic tendencies, his addiction to blood and robbery, in addition, he knew that in his deep in his subconscious, he had an Oedipus complex, and he also had strong desires for sexual perversions. On and on and on. <clears throat> the board accepted his explanation, and they certified him. You know, there's another way of looking at a law at a mitzvah. Imagine, you're a citizen of the United States. There's a president who is in office. But the two of you, the president and yourself really have no relationship. Imagine if you received a call from the president's office saying that he was going to be speaking downtown tonight. And somehow he has a tuxedo that is at the cleaners. And they ask you, can you please pick up the president's tuxedo and bring it downtown to the center and give it to the president? If you pick up his tux and then give it, deliver and give it to him, now there exists a relationship between you and the president. And with each act that you would do, in addition to the relationship between you and the president, would get stronger and stronger. That's a mitzvah. By doing a mitzvah, by doing a commandment that God has asked us, we create a relationship with God Almighty. And with each mitzvah we do, the relationship gets stronger and stronger. So we need to stop trying to understand God and exercise in futility and just serve him. I find it interesting that we complain about God judging us when, in reality, we judge him constantly. All the laws that God has commanded us to observe were given to us out of love. These laws are for our benefit, not his. 
So let us follow what Rabbi Akiva said is the most important law in the Torah. The Ahavta L'Riachel Kamoka, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This pandemic has caused us to realize just how much other people mean to us and what a difference they make in our lives. Love is the ingredient that will bring the final redemption. And with that knowledge, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this interesting and enjoying. And uh, again, may God bless you with safety and health. And um, hopefully next week we'll talk a little bit for the Seder again next Wednesday. The uh, Pesach will begin on uh, Saturday night. And uh, hopefully next uh, Wednesday we'll be able to talk about a few things that may help us to connect with God a little better this year. Again, thank you very much for attending. God bless and be well.